Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our second day of our UNESCO Univoc Learning Forum, uh, Managing Skills in a Time of Disruption. Uh, I hope you had a nice day yesterday. Um, you've learned a lot about uh, disruptions and how we can address them, and also uh, enjoyed the strategy labs where we had a bit more time for discussion, and then, of course, in the evening, the reception at the old town hall. Um, yesterday we were talking a bit more about um, what we know about the impact of disruptions uh, and the particular challenges that come with them. Uh, in the second plenary we were talking about uh, examples of how countries and institutions uh, uh, respond to those challenges and um, how they manage to handle the effects of the disruption. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about enhancing the pathways for learning uh, and have some panel discussions on innovative teaching and learning and technology applications as well as uh, managing the skill potential of disrupted workplaces. Um, with that, I would like to hand over uh, to uh, Luis Sahilas from uh, CDFOP. He will uh, moderate the first panel. Today we have five panelists, so we don't want to uh, cut out too much time uh, with the introduction. Uh, so he will introduce the speakers, and this session will, tar uh, will target uh, the learning pathways and how the labor market disruptions uh, uh, are affected uh, and how uh, uh, they ensure the employment of self-development. Thank you. Oh, it's fine, okay. Sorry. Good morning to everybody. Uh, thanks, again for the introduction. Uh, the morning session is always difficult after also the party we had yesterday, but uh, still I think we have a task to fulfill and it's a difficult task because as you see us, we have a panel of five and uh, so we will manage to have uh, five different presentations, a number of questions and still be able to keep the timeline which foresees just 75 minutes. So. This session is about uh, pathways, pathways leading to learning and employability. And we all know that the road to professional development and also in our way to find a job is long and steep. But unfortunately or fortunately, we all know that we don't have any other alternative. We cannot wake up one day and find ourselves with one qualification and a, and a very nice job. We have to invest in time, in efforts, in money. It's, it's a very complicated process. But still, this is a process that we have to undergo, and we all know that we have to undergo throughout our whole life. But here we, are, we have to discuss ways that can improve these processes. We have the opportunity to see this pathway, the pathway leading to learning and employment, from different perspectives. And we are quite lucky to have a very well-selected panel that will give you exactly these different angles that will help you have more ideas and more practical examples of what we can do. So the session will be as follows. Each speaker will have 10 minutes. We have to be exactly in 10 minutes' time to have everything done. There will be just a statement that will follow. I will ask a very short question, and then the, 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 the next speaker will take over. Hopefully, we will be able to have a number of questions at the ending of these uh, five rounds, because then it's a break, and the, the break is always a holy period of the day. So uh, I will start without saying anything, anything else with the first presentation. Ms. Agnes Dietzen, she works for BIB, she is the head of research section on competence development in BIB, and of course she will speak about what else, about work-based learning, and uh, of course the challenges that are linked to all this. Uh, Agnes, the, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning everybody, good morning ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it very much to have the possibility uh, to contribute to the session on enhancing pathways for learning and employment. And what I'm trying to do in, in very scarce time, 10 minutes, is to give you, to present you some results of a literature study on the current stage of work-based learning for an entrance 
and on the uh, results of a uh, common um, work uh, together with UNIWORK, UNESCO, within in the network and the BIBB, and just exactly a workshop which, uh, which was there in, in Bonn last year at the same time on that topic, on work-based learning. And we um, evaluated um, this, the, the discussions, and I think I have the opportunities to give you an impression about these uh, common work. Yes, and to go in medias res, um, the, uh, the literature on work-based learning is very huge. Everybody of you might know that and also the uh, notions about what is it exactly, they are very widespread and I, I could only mention three of them which have um, a, a widespreadness in, in the clo on global scale. That is learning for work that in, involves also vocational programs delivered in schools and colleges, learning at work, uh, which is training delivered in companies and l learning through work uh, which denotes acquiring skills and knowledge in the process of doing a job. Um, you see in that expressions you find almost every element of different kind of systems uh, in that all over the world. Um, only one uh, hint VBL, work-based learning, is often linked to informal learning, that is right, but is, uh, it's also in many countries, it's a formal um, frame of reference where work-based learning um, is, is uh, elaborated. Um, it belongs, uh, for example, in Germany, uh, it's an, a core principle of apprenticeship uh, in the venue of company-based training. Um, accordingly, the, the uh, learning subjects are persons in formal education as well as, in, as employees, and the learning subjects not um, is, it's not only professional, but also social and personal competences and skills. I come back to that later on. One result was also that guidance from tutors and colleagues increases the potential of VBS. And what are now the strengths uh, um, the, it became obvious in, in different kind of studies? I just mentioned only a few. Of course, it's uh, the acquisition of practical skills and competences that is uh, the great advantage of work-based learning. And um, another strength is that competences are de developed by a process of reflective practice, practice or in, within in a community of practice in, in a dynamically changing professional world. And um, learning is always, in a way, uh, an innovation, and it, uh, it involves also a reflection. And if it is guided, it's even more uh, fruitful. Another strength uh, is that uh, Work-based learning gives the opportunity to transfer and applicate codified uh, disciplinary knowledge gained in universities and schools into work by it's, it's by a process of recontextualization uh, within the work. It's making knowledge apl applied. That is an, a real advantage of it. And finally. Uh, Let's say for on a system level, work-based learning gives the opportunities for a better matching of competence profiles, of individual competence profiles, and labor market opportunities. Um, as a result of the literature review, we identified the following four research uh, and design issues for VBL which might have a relevance on the global scales. In the following slides, I will address thematic issues and the related research and design challenges. 
Of course, only a few because it's <laughs> because of time. Well, the first one, the conductive factors for learning on the level of individual level and the work environment. Um, well, you, know, you might know some workplaces are more suitable as learning spaces than others, and various context factors play an influential role for retrieving the potential of work-based learning. You find uh, some of them uh, as a thematic issue over there. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, um, the continue of work, convictions about learning and working, and, and of course, um, the allocation and structure of work, and most which is often neglected, also what we call agency, that is motivations, attitudes, and uh, convictions about learning and about what is knowledge. Well, uh, challenging questions about that um, are why do some workplaces create better environments for learning than others? Or how might employers and work-based learning providers co-produce programs that, tell, that help improve workplace learning capacities as well as developing individual expertise? You know, it's a challenge also of um, research, but also on design. That is a question and of co corporate design between different kind of actors in the field, which are very differently, of course, uh, on a global scale. Um, the second uh, high value topic is curriculum development. That is, uh, of course, not surprising. Um, I just want to um, give a hint that um, all the studies uh, give a hint to that, that the traditional forms of development uh, uh, curricula, which are often very didactical, school-based, are not a, a very good way to, to develop uh, curricula for a workforce. Okay, I see two minutes left, so um, here in that space, it's important that also a collaborative approach has to be chosen uh, and an appropriate mo methods uh, to identifying work and relevant skills. And that is an, a real challenge uh, to do that in an appropriate way and also to construct and file it in in a structure of uh, qualification and competences. So, also the role of tutors are in a way well-known <clears throat> guidance and support. I already mentioned it uh, are very uh, important requisites for that. The research issues are here that it's not clear what are the key uh, actors in the field. Quite often for Germany, of course, we see that the trainers are an indefinite group of persons. They are often experienced colleagues and who do the huge work in that. So, and um, it's a special um, demand here how to uh, improve also their standing in the, in the companies and also how to improve their knowledge and their ways to guide. The, la the last one, so it's uh, the topic of boundary crossing, which means very different things. I gave you an impression here uh, what, in what way it was discussed also in the literature, but also in, in, in the, um, in, on the workshop. Uh, well, boundary crossing, it means, of course, learning and applying skills and uh, competences across a variety of contexts. But it was also discussed as an organizational concept, how to bridge demands on education, information, and practice-based research, which is necessary also to give, to have uh, good programs, educational programs. And last not least, uh, boundary cross crossing uh, touches the impact of how to 
um, assess and validate and recognize um, um, competences uh, over a different kind of uh, segments, of educational segments, uh, from vocational training to higher education and, and vice versa. That is also a crossing of boundaries. Well, questions here. I, for me, the most important one is how we could strengthen learners to apply acquired skills and companies in new settings. That is uh, a question of transferring competences. We speak always about it, but for, as a researcher, we, do, we don't know very much about what kind of requisites conditions we need for transferring um, skills and competences. So now I, I'm off almost at the end. Um, well, I, I, I take that note for the question I expect. So I come to the, my final slate. That is, um, if you want additional information, Please wait a little bit more. We have produced an, a very nice book together with the colleagues from Munewak on, on UNESCO. You find there a hint and you find an uh, outside slate about, uh, about it. And I think the most of these contents I rushed about here um, will you find more intensively and reflected in the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry for the press. I had no. asked, using uh, football terminology, to use yellow and red card. But you see, we have three rounds now, yeah. so it's even better. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, very helpful. Uh, yeah. Just before asking you a question, to under underline once again, that you can find plenty of information uh, both in Univoc and the uh, BEEP side, but also I have to advertise SEDEFOP, so our also organization has plenty of information about all the issues we are discussing today. So just a, a question, a statement from your side. We know that uh, work-based learning is actually a way to respond to needs of the society and the economy. From your international experiences, uh, which are the best ways to enhance it in a successful way? How do you believe, how we can, we can achieve this? Yeah, so, huh? no, it's almost, it's not working anymore. Well, okay, I can, I can tell it to you. Uh, okay, no, I, I think um, I will try to improve, uh, to improve, improvise. Um, well, I think, um, uh, Work-based learning um, sh um, lets to focus on individual learners and their learning conditions while acknowledging um, changing uh, in intensities of engagement in their career and professional development. I think uh, from a, a system point of view, it's really a different kind of uh, a shift of perspective, not only to look to the system curricula, but also to looking to, to focus individual learners within a framework of, of competence-based education. Um, and that is what I, I think it's to have to file in. Um, Competence-based uh, education allows reflections on forms and scopes of the VBL along a continuum from informal to formal institutional settings across different regional TVET systems and local practices. And therefore, I think it's a good framework also for our work here. Thank you. Thank you. And so we move, we move from work-based learning, and the, the next speaker is Inge Gorostiaga. Uh, Inge is a manager of, for entrepreneurship and innovation at uh, TKNI, you will explain, this is quite complicated, uh, in the Basque country of Spain, and um, she will present how we can develop entrepreneurial talent to promote innovation and enhance transition to work. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
its Technica, a research and applied innovation center for vocational training in the Basque Country. So my topic today, first of all, thank you for giving me the chance for being there. Um, my topic for today is how we develop the entrepreneurial talent of the young students that are in the bed centers. For, in our opinion, for developing the country, it's essential to develop the people. Companies, as we see yesterday, are changing, are changing and there is a real need for high skilled workers and we would like that our young people and students see self-employment as a valuable option for them in the future. So from the Vice Ministry of Vocational and Educational Training in the Basque Government through Technica, the institution where I work, of the Department of, the De of Education, we develop many initiatives to develop these transversals or soft skills. We have the entrepreneurial programs and we go for the high performance cycles focused on talents-based learning. Today, I will focus in the first topic, the entrepreneurial programs. We have a compulsory module in the curriculum, 60 hours, where students learn to learn by enterprising. They use a startup, we use a startup as a real tool and they have to produce or provide a real product or service. By this way, we develop their skills for being good professionals, employables, entrepreneurs or intra-entrepreneurs. We are really worried about this, being intra-entrepreneurs, be an entrepreneur wherever you go to work. In the Basque country, we are at the north of Spain, we have a program named ICAS Empresa, and this school year we have been working with more or less 80 centers, 4,500 students, and they have created more than 800 students' company from September till March. Then some of them will go one step further and they will create real companies. For helping the teachers to go through this program, we provide them with all the necessary tools. So we generate open educational resources for our teachers. They do an excellent job, but to reinforce this job and to encourage the Basque Country Network, we make some activities from Technica with the, with the students. Initial meetings, ICAS Empresa Congress and ICAS Empresa Fair. In the Congress, this year we make an innovation every day, every school year we try to innovate and make something different. We make some questions to ourselves. I don't have time to go through all of them, so it's better for you to read it them quickly. And finally, that's the way we start with the Congress that you will see right now in a video. Please, the video. Solíamos organizar un montón de congresos para que todas las casas empresas tuvieran la oportunidad de presentarnos su idea de negocio. Pero este año lo hemos hecho de una manera diferente. Bye. La envidia sí que tan, la UCAO ni casi se sale, aprovecha chicos no, se ven de un lado y casi se desorienta con el caso de vos te unes tan, rural de acá, van a ser esta, salió es verdinha que se hincha, el rural de la cocha. Mi chico la verá, es una cocha, un lado y una verdad, maricas de aquí, la mucho de cultura y quinceañera. Thank you.
un poco lo que pretendemos con el taller de Lego, la temática que le hemos puesto es construyendo mi mundo laboral o mi futuro del mundo laboral, entonces es una técnica que ayuda a que salga todo eso que llevamos un poco en el inconsciente o dentro y que facilita poder compartirlo. La verdad es que es interesante porque estamos aprendiendo, yo por lo menos estoy aprendiendo a cómo comunicarme y a perder un poco la vergüenza. La persona con estos emprendimientos ¿no? pueda mejorar su calidad de vida ¿no? y que a la vez eh, está mejorando la calidad de vida de, de la sociedad. Que dentro de las organizaciones ellos al final pueden decidir qué tipo de, de organización quieren ser. En este congreso estamos trabajando una serie de actividades en las que nos permiten desarrollar nuestras competencias transversales, nuestras competencias personales eh, mediante la relación con otros que nos muestran sus diferentes ideas de negocio que están desarrollando. Y casi de valor haciendo este positivo aquí. La usted de la estabate. Está estudiando con esta que nada está penetrando de la banda. Están con, con alumnos de otros centros, de la manera que tienen que participar el resto de los alumnos, y cogen también ideas para eh, ir entablando diferentes formas de compromiso entre las diferentes y campos empresas. Y luego están, están contentos porque es una forma en la que trabajan haciendo y ven realmente para qué sirve todo lo que están aprendiendo en clase. Por nuestra parte nos estamos pasando muy bien. Está siendo todo bastante llevadero, muy bien. Y, y eso, y estamos encantados de estar aquí y ser emprendedor. Animo a la gente a participar, ha sido muy querido. La verdad es que está muy a gusto y, y todo muy bien. Así que, ser emprendedor. Aukera balde makazu, gonbidapena balde makazu nea tortzeko aukera matezu. Idei batekin zertzea eta bukatzezu beste idei batekin. Eta nik uste aukera polita dela zure enpresa beste ikus puntu batetik ikusteko. Eta nere uste gonbidapena honek urte askotan jarraitu behar dela. Eta ekin zaila izan. An example of how we work with our students, our teachers, and our vet centers. If we could continue with the presentation, please. So you have seen five, uh, five workshops. The first one, communication, short explanation about their business idea, students in front of many people like me today explaining their business idea and three of the best communications of the day were awarded with an escape room session for continuing developing their personal skills. We have another workshop, My Dream, where they work how to transform their dream or passion into a business idea, basic finances for creating their own company, it's the most difficult part, so they have many challenges to develop it. Uh, building the labor market, we work how they see the labor market with Legos. And finally, the ICAS Empresa Café, first-hand experiences related to entrepreneurship, where they have the opportunity to see how to make one step further when they finish studying, they suit a startup or create their own company with institutional help. We have five days, so five congresses in three different places in the Basque Country, more or less 600 students, 120 averages per day, Participant, participants, students, teachers, pairs, institutions, entrepreneurs, and other associations related to helping people to be an entrepreneur, to start up. To sum up, students live in their comfort zone. We take them outside the school center for developing their skills, such as communication, autonomy, initiatives. They were working with unknown people. Sometimes it's difficult for them. And they have to choose 
and decide in which workshop they will take part. Normally, we tell them what to do. In this case, they have different options and they were the ones choosing the workshop they would like to take part from. This is the way we work for developing the entrepreneurial talent to enhance the transition to work and innovation. And this is an example of students working one day with us. Today, I would like to show you an example because I could be talking and talking and I prefer to show you the video. <laughs> Finished. Yes, I am on time. We are. <laughs> Thanks, Inge, you are indeed on time. Uh, of course, everyone, everyone is persuaded, I believe, uh, in, regarding the need uh, for an entre entrepreneurial skills and an entrepreneurial way of thinking. Uh, my question could be, how can we integrate all these on existing uh, pathways and curricula uh, of TVET? Okay. Uh, when I talk with other people from other countries, I realized that all of us are really worried about the curriculum. In the curriculum, we have theoretical and aptitudinal, aptitudinal content. But for me, instead of focusing in the curriculum, it's most, it's most the most important thing is to focus on how we achieve all these content, contents of the curriculum. Not the curriculum, how to achieve, achieve the skills and the contents of the curriculum. So we focused on the methodology. We provide the students the main role of the learning process with the challenge-based learning because in Technica we make one question to ourselves in the entrepreneurial department and these days that everything is changing so fast, uh, industry is changing, everything is changing, the skills are changing, so for how, how long would they remember or could be useful the theoretical content, and for how long these aptitudinal skills should be useful for these students, because using these aptitudinal contents, they would be able to use all the information that is in the telephone or in the computer for being able to go to the labor market. So, in my opinion, focused on how to achieve the skills instead of focusing in the curriculum. Action. Thanks a lot. And uh, we're doing well with time, so let's move to the third speaker. Uh, the third speaker is Mr. Simon Field. He's just beside me. And uh, Simon is the founder and director of Skills Policy LTD and the leading expert on inter international comparative analysis of country skills system. He is also a UNESCO consultant. So uh, one, the, the issue that will be addressed right now by Samu Simon is one of them very important, I think, at least at systemic level. How can we remove dead ends for TVET graduates? This is a really important question. The floor is yours, Simon. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to be very brief, uh, uh, partly because we don't have a lot of time, but partly also because I have the privilege of speaking again in one of the Strategy Labs sessions uh, that follows. And I'm sure you don't want to hear me saying the same thing twice. You, you may or may not want to hear me say it once, but it's for sure that you don't want me to hear me saying it twice. There is also, in addition to that, there will be a UNESCO publication coming out in the next few months. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, that uh, publication will uh, uh, expand on some of the things I'm going to talk about. So in the past, uh, we used to think that TVET was simple. It was about training uh, that you did. You followed the training, and then you did a job, and that job went on for the whole of your life. It was really very, very simple. Now, all that's changed. Uh, why has it changed? It's changed because people's aspirations have in increased. People expect to go on to have further learning opportunities after their initial training. 
It's changed because the labor market has changed, because uh, the, our economies expect higher level uh, skills. It's changed because uh, our societies and economies continue to change so that people will expect to reskill and upskill throughout their lives. So that's a very simple pattern that we, we still somehow have in our minds, and many people have in their minds when, we, we, in their minds when they, when, when they uh, think of TVET, of one bit of training leading to one job for life is, is increasingly outdated. Now, that process represents both a huge opportunity for TVET and a huge threat. Let me say why it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity because all those young people who are going through initial TVET, getting their initial training, should have and often will have opportunities to go on learning throughout their lives, acquiring further qualifications, uh, developing higher skills, going into universities if they want to. And that is a huge efflorescence of human talent and skill. That's fantastic. But at the same time, it's a huge threat. And that's because to the extent that initial vocational training still is or is still seen in that very simple traditional form. One bit of training leading to one job for life. It will be or be seen as a dead end. And that can make initial vet profoundly unattractive. And just as an example of the way that can affect policies, uh, about five years ago in Sweden, there was a reform of the upper secondary vet system which in effect uh, split the, broke the link between upper secondary vocational training and direct entry into tertiary education. And as a result of that, uh, the attractiveness of upper secondary vet fell, the numbers of people going into the, uh, that, that track has, has dropped substantially, and the government is now thinking of reversing that reform to reopen those links to tertiary education. Now, because of the profound importance of the, uh, of the business of opening up pathways, of uh, removing dead ends, UNESCO has given increasing attention to this uh, issue in recent years uh, uh, and promulgated a recommendation following the Shanghai conference in, in 2012. And further work is going on now that I'm involved in that is going to lead it to a publication later on this year on this topic. And the business of that work is really about promoting effective pathways, in particular from graduates of initial TVET. Now, what do we mean by effective pathways? It doesn't mean that everyone who goes through initial vocational training has to pursue some further learning program. I mean, some people still follow the traditional pattern. They do some training and they follow a job throughout life, and that's fine. That works for them. The, aim of, the, the idea of effective pathways is that there should be opportunities for all. And that means, at a minimum, no artificial barriers, no, uh, tick, uh, no arrangements whereby um, there's a ticked box, which means that because you've had initial vocational training, you can never go on to the further learning opportunities that are your heart's desire and from which you could benefit. But it means more than that also. It means that there should be active measures in place that can assist people who would like further learning and can benefit from further learning to pursue those pathways. Now, the benefits of these pathways are enormous, and it starts with the removal of dead ends, which increases uh, the attractiveness of initial TVET. 
But it goes on from there. There are huge benefits both to the individual and to society and, an econ and to societies and economies if people have the opportunity to upskill and reskill throughout their lives. Uh, but perhaps one of the most important benefits is actually an equity benefit. Now, if we have a world in which, on the one hand, you have one set of individuals following what we might call the royal route, going through general academic education and entering universities. And on the other, you have the world of people who get some kind of vocational training. And you have a wall between those two worlds. That is never, ever going to be good for equity. It's going to be disastrous for equity for all sorts of obvious reasons. And if you think of particular population groups where equity issue arises, uh, pathways are also vital. If you take migrants, for example, who arrive in a country perhaps with good skills but without recognized qualifications, they will need avenues that are not on that royal route. If you take women, perhaps returning to the labor market in mid-career, they need pathways too that are not necessarily on that royal route uh, 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 that, that flows from uh, initial education to, uh, to, uh, to university. Now, all of those things all of those challenges are easy to say, and you probably all agree with what I've said. The challenge is to actually put it all to work. What's the toolbox for making all this happen? Now, that's what I'm going to be talking about in the Strategy Labs session that follows. And it's also very much the topic of the UNESCO report, which will come out later this year. So I'm not going to uh, uh, say uh, anything about it now. I mean, it's going to go into things like national qualifications frameworks, recognition of prior learning, careers guidance, bridging programs, widening participation issues, short cycle uh, post-secondary education, and so forth. But those are the tools which are really, really vital for turning the, 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 the aspirations to remove dead ends, which we all in this room agree with, and turning it into reality. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think you already mentioned what you are going to present in, during the labs, but as an appetizer, I would like to have from your side just a very short question. Uh, we, we want to actually to make a reality lifelong learning for TVET students. And one question that is burning, let's say, and I want just a simple answer, of course you can talk for ages about this, is are there any existing strategies that offer, let's say, viable and attractive pathways beyond TVET and that can provide the, the students with all the requirements that are needed in order to face the, face the challenges of disruptions. So do we have already strategies in place that could be further exploited by other countries? Yes, I think we do. Um, and Often, I think we, we, it's more a question of uh, applying those strategies. Um, and f it's, uh, if I can just make one remark about the, the, the way in which those challenges emerge, when we talk about lifelong learning all the time, and, but actually if you look at what's happening sometimes in countries, sometimes it's all going into reverse. Um, it, 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 I mean, just one example... Um, in the UK at the moment, um, uh, there are, despite all the rhetoric, 
there has been this extraordinary collapse in part-time higher education where the numbers of students have halved and in some cases dropped to one-third of the levels they were 10 years ago. And that's partly because of funding changes, but it's also because of worryingly changes in the labor market. Somewhere like the UK where they're further ahead in deregular deregulation and the gig economy and so on. There's an awful lot of self-employed people who don't have an employer who can say, yes, you can have time off and go off and do that course. And those are some of the very big challenges that, that, that we face. Thanks. So we are moving right now to the fourth presentation. Uh, the, the presentation will be by Maria, Maria or Suzanne de la Rama. Suzanne, preferably, I suppose. I had also a Maria. And uh, Suzanne actually is the ex executive director of the Certification Office of the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority in the, Philippine, in the Philippines. And uh, the presentation actually will be on uh, recognition of prior learning and reintegration of returning migrants. So the floor is yours, uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Lucas. Um, okay, so 10 minutes is so short to discuss all of the things that I have put in there. But um, this is an interplay of not only recognition of prior learning, uh, but also includes a quality assured assessment and certification system, which is the means for recognition of prior learning, and uh, the use of technology to improve the skills of the Filipinos, um, whether domestic or migrant workers. So let me just go through this very quickly uh, about uh, TESDA, so uh, just to give the context to this, um, what I'm going to present. Um, TESDA is one of the <clears throat> education ministries in the country uh, taking care of TVET. The rest, the other two are for basic education and higher education. And uh, this is our uh, quality Assured Technical Education Skills Development, or you might call TVET system. I've highlighted this um, recognition of prior learning, equivalency schemes, and lifelong learning as underpinning, underlying principles in this whole system. When we started as TESDA, we already started with this. We start with industry consultation to get their needs and then go through development of training standards we call training regulations, which we use for development curriculum, registering programs. We are the authority in the Philippines. We are a regulatory body. So all those who will offer TVET programs will have to register with TESDA. At the moment, we have about 4,000 TVET institutions, 91% of which are private. And of course, um, they go through uh, an assessment and certification, uh, e either after graduation or uh, just uh, from work experience, we can go through assessment and certification. If they pass, then they get the national certificates. Oops. Um, these are different delivery modes, so uh, we uh, really have to um, adapt to every situation. We have institution-based, and these are the schools. Um, the enterprise-based uh, through dual training system, apprenticeship system, or our company-based uh, learning system. So, um, and community-based, we go to the communities, work with the local government units. And uh, we have also mobile training, so there are buses that are equipped and they go around uh, the community. And the last, but uh, this is the most uh, useful and uh, close to me because I'm in charge of this, is the test the online program. Um, briefly, this is our uh, qualifications framework, and you see the blue one in the middle. That's what we are in charge of, from national certificates level one to diploma. And uh, there can be pathways going to higher education. Again, underlying principle here is recognition of prior learning, equivalency, and lifelong learning. So the way we do rec recognition of prior learning is really through assessment and certification. We gather evidence. So either you have gone through a training, formal training program, or through informal training, or even no training, but you have been at work and have, been, uh, have learned this at work. 
So there are ways of gathering the evidence, demonstration, assessment of technical qualities. Uh, you, uh, you show the finished product. There are written tests, interview, and review of previous work performed. Um, there can also be third-party reports or references using our uh, portfolio assessment. So that is the national certificate. You see it here. The national certificate contains all the competencies that he can perform. So you cannot read this, but all those lines in the middle, those are the competencies, basic, which are the soft skills, common um, technical competencies across uh, sector, and then the core competencies, which are the specific skills and tasks that, that um, for example, in this case, automotive service technician should be able to perform. So with the show of this national certificate, the employer would know what he can do. So for us, uh, RPL is a process used to identify, document, assess, and certify a person's knowledge, skills, and competencies, regardless of how, when, or where the learning occurred against prescribed standards for a part partial or full qualification. So we go through the assessment, but the, our assessment is based on a training regulation. So that training regulation was developed together with industry, so that's um, industry standards. Uh, if we don't have the training regulation, then we cannot assess. Um, I say here skill certification is an enabler in migration or labor mobility. This is key, and it has been shown in our ASEAN mutual recognition arrangements for tourism professionals. So um, TESDA is a certifying body in um, the Philippines um, that will have to uh, show the uh, certificates for our tourism professionals, which will be acceptable to the other ASEAN countries. We are also uh, pilot testing the McKenzie study on uh, this one is with the uh, uh, Gulf countries. And it's now being practiced also. We are practicing this to provide better opportunities to our overseas Filipino workers, especially for women in um, vulnerable jobs. So this is our Imperatives. These are our imperatives for what we do in TESDA, and you'll see that, that uh, OFWs, or the Overseas Filipino Workers, is one of them. So this is our practice now that we're doing. We're doing on-site assessments, so we're going to countries where there are mo uh, most of our OFWs are. Um, you see, this is in Dubai. We did this in 2014, and after getting, after passing, then they got their certificates, and they're very happy. One of them said, "Now I'm a professional hairdresser because before, well, he has, she has been going uh, through different clients, customers, fixing their hair, coloring their hair, and now that she is certified, she's happy about it." Um, the the background of it is, um, we, we thought before that this. Uh, cannot happen. This will not happen because we're only in charge in the country, in the Philippines. But when our Secretary of Labor give, gave us this directive, then we have to do it. And it uh, aligned with our Secretary at that time, uh, who is young, and so he's technology savvy. He wants to use technology to be able to reach out to all the Filipinos in the world. And then the, the next uh, secretaries or ministers um, also have this uh, vision, and uh, it's good that it's being supported now. So this is uh, uh, the on-site assessment. It will really assess current knowledge and skills of OFWs, whether they acquired it through training or through the work that they have done there. Like a um, domestic worker may have a very demanding employer, and so he she would know already how to fix the room or cook good food or whatever, uh, we will test if uh, he, she will pass our assessment. So that's the framework. I did not go through it, but in the end, the outcome is uh, for reintegration of our OFWs and upgrading the status of our domestic workers. So DW is domestic workers from household work to um, institutional work, because when they're in the households, they're really vulnerable to abuse and to other exploitation. So we've been to um, these countries in the Middle East, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Jeddah, and Riyadh, Kuwait, and Qatar. And in Asia, we've been to Singapore and Hong Kong. We'll start with Malaysia soon. And these are the qualifications that we have done. Um, 
And the last one is the trainer's methodology, and that's for um, we want to sustain the program by developing also assessors where the, uh, in the country. So we have to train them to become assessors also. So um, this is our, um, these are our objectives for empowering overseas Filipino workers. And uh, so far we've uh, assessed 1,354. That's only up to end of 2017. But this May, my team went there to um, assess in uh, Riyadh and Jeddah, and about 400 of them were assessed. So that would add up to this. And we've certified 1,071, or a certification rate of 79%. So this is a sample, one of those we have assessed. Even if she's an industrial engineering graduate, she works as a customer service staff, but because of um, the training she got from uh, her colleagues. So there are Filipino communities who train other uh, overseas Filipino workers. And this one's they are teachers in Hong Kong who uh, who became domestic workers in Hong Kong. Teachers in the Philippines went to Hong Kong and um, uh, worked as domestic workers, so we did this, and uh, they went back, and now they're teachers again. And so this is how we use technology, um, even in assessment. In the assessment of trainers or assessors, we need three member panels, so we cannot send all of them, like this one is in uh, Saudi Arabia, so two of them would be in the Philippines, one there, and it's using Skype or um, whatever can be used. We also use a lot of social media because Filipinas are very good at social media. So they send their videos through Facebook. Um, and we have the TESDA online program, so this is where this supports their learning. Um, if they want to become massage therapists, but they are not, you know, very simple reflexology, that's what they're doing, so they, we support them with our TESDA online program to be ready for the assessment. So these are the courses that we have. Um, oh, um, just one. Um, <laughs> for all those who we as whom we assessed, um, 804 uh, were in courses or qualifications where we have the test the online program, and 12, 203 of them were users, and 89.66 percent of them passed, and it's higher than the overall. So these are the success factors. And um, we have right now 1.15 million registered users in our test, the online program. Also, uh, there are, of course, challenges to this also, and this is my last slide. Um, so thank you, and mabuhay. Thank you, Susan. It's, it was a very interesting approach and a practical approach, I could say. Uh, what is interesting, and it's just I want from you a message. That means how you manage to turn a disruption to a positive scenario, because this is quite important. Um, yes. Uh, well, one thing, it's our leaders. The vision of our leaders made this happen. So they also have to uh, think differently um, we cannot do business as usual. So when they said, um, okay, you have to go there and do assessment. So we have to go there. We made it happen. And uh, so that's one. And also the cooperation of our partners, wherever they are, um, other uh, government agencies, other ministries also, and the cooperation of the Filipinos themselves. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So we are on time and we are moving to the last presentation. So I'm happy to uh, ask from Professor Hamid Ahmed to move to something different. That means to present a country experience, uh, the reform that takes place in Iraq. And uh, Professor uh, Hamid Ahmed is chairman of the National TVET Supreme Coordination Committee that belongs to the Prime Minister's office. Uh, Professor. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Lokas. And um, I extend my thanks to UNIVOC, UNESCO, for their kind uh, invitation. <clears throat> uh, I chose this, uh, actually, the, the, the title for this presentation. 
And I think the main disruptive uh, for all the underpinning cause for all this immigration, refugee, uh, uh, ex-combatant, internal displaced people is actually the wars and conflict. <clears throat> and we believe that uh, reforming um, TEVIT or TEVIT education is uh, an important uh, factor uh, uh, for, for security uh, and also could be very well peace dividend. Uh, I, I thought I might give you a couple of slides just to give the people from different parts of the world some background about education in Iraq. Uh, education in Iraq was considered in 1977 <clears throat> and was the best actually system in the Middle East. Uh, but unfortunately, the wars, the sanction uh, from 1980 to 2003, uh, the education system is the first and most uh, victims of these conflict and war, uh, and the education system is collapsed really. Since 2003 to 2011, the government uh, started many initiatives uh, along with the international agencies to bring about uh, national education strategy 2011-2020, as well as TVIT strategy 2014-2023. And we were anticipate at a time that after 2011, there would be a controlled discipline performance and result. Uh, and this year from 2003 to 2011, considered as a transitional period. But unfortunately, we stuck with ISIS, invaded uh, our country, and the three big cities, almost a third of the country, was occupied by ISIS, and we came back really to square one. Uh, when I talk about Iraq uh, society, for the people who don't know Iraq, being a biologist um, and an ecologist, uh, as our dear friend yesterday mentioned, I look into our uh, society as really a conflict ecosystem. Uh, so many factors inside Iraq uh, conflict with each other and uh, give us all these trained radicalized fighters and refugee. Uh, and, and this a conflict ecosystem really is an environment where um, precisely create chaos uh, as a Abu Bakr, uh, the guy who is actually in charge of uh, a book which is considered as a Bible for ISIS. When the liberated area, uh, we went to, to the colleges and, and institutes and schools and we find a book which is considered as Bible for ISIS, and the book called The Management of Savagery. It's, it's very, even the name is very provocative. Uh, and the idea is uh, how to justify all their barbaric um, actions. So this environment or this conflict is a fertile uh, area where the jihadists and all these extremist uh, ideology thrive. Uh, uh, the uh, discussion paper provided by UNESCO and UNIVOC uh, in 2007, almost um, 11 years ago, uh, provided by a conflict and education research group at Cambridge University uh, under the title Education for Livelihood and Civic Participation in Post-Conflict Countries. Uh, uh, pose a few questions and identify a few, few important questions uh, and then provide actually by the end of their analysis uh, an evidence-based uh, information that TVIT uh, education could be an a, 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 a important role for uh, social integration and, 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 and for, for, for peace uh, and security. <clears throat> uh, Post-conflict ISIS in Iraq, uh, the curriculum we found it is actually reflect ISIS philosophy. Uh, children and youth at that area were subject to the psychological warfare at its finest. More than three million IDPs, returning fighters, often disabled, injured, 
uh, need special rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitation, education, and inclusion. Uh, and most of our education and cultural system and heritage in that area were actually destroyed or deteriorated. Uh, uh, almost, almost uh, total collapse of education uh, services in this area. Uh, and we know that uh, re-establishing is a low process, a slow process, uh, and we know that a lot of uh, youth and children actually denied uh, education and hence uh, it require a very urgent attention from the Iraqi government or from the international community. Uh, that's why in this paper, which I just mentioned, they talk that the intervention is, should be in the right times, or they call it the best times uh, for this education program, actually in the reconstruction process. Previously, international agencies in post-conflict area, they consider or they emphasize more on uh, relief aids, and they always overlook education. I think nowadays there is a perception that this education, especially TVIT, in the post-conflict area should be considered an integral part of the relief because it has got some component of security and, and, and peace dividend in it. That's why I think we are lucky to have this program funded by EU, executed by UNESCO, who are they doing actually a brilliant job in Iraq uh, about uh, reforming of the TIVIT system. The TIVIT system in Iraq is fragmented, and we hope that during this project, uh, try to uh, coordinate uh, uh, that TIVIT fragmented system. We've got many ministries, actually three ministries mainly, Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of so Labor and Social Affairs. Each one provide uh, a, a, a training uh, uh, services, uh, other ministries as well. So the idea is how to bring that poorly linked uh, uh, systems with each other in order to provide a, a cohesive, uh, integral uh, TEVIT uh, system. Uh, and we have this actually uh, program um, which have uh, mainly about governance, uh, about uh, uh, demand-driven um, uh, uh, system, uh, and also uh, we have a part of it about employability and capacity building for the... I know I'm, I'm very uh, conscious about the time. Uh, we have a twin-track system, uh, the uh, governance arrangement, uh, as well as uh, uh, transitional and pilot arrangement. We've already involved in it and it, it needed time due to the bureaucracies, almost the, we have a draft law for the National TVIT Board where connect all these ministries uh, and the draft law is currently in the Shura Council and we anticipate in a few months hopefully the, the, the law will be uh, drafted or will be implemented. Um, uh, we also uh, uh, trying to work on national vocational qualification framework and we agreed to have 10 level after many discussion and workshop with many uh, international experts. The competency based curriculum is currently MOLSA doing some pilot uh, scale with it. Uh, as I mentioned capacity building, the British Council is doing that for the leader, uh, technician and uh, uh, and demonstrators. That, that's uh, as a, a big project. We call it uh, what we call uh, um, uh, far-fetched, uh, and we are working on it. But we have another program by GAC, uh, which is Canadian. Uh, Click and uh, WOSC, both of them, is doing quite a, a good uh, 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 program for the ex-combatant and return refugee in this liberated area, just giving them three month intensive course in building and machinery in order to build their own uh, cities that's been uh, demolished by ISIS. Uh, uh, they're working now for three years from this uh, year and hopefully they 
target is 3,000 uh, person, uh, 1,000 female, 2,000 male, with different skills to go back to their work. And uh, uh, actually, there's other uh, program by uh, uh, JICA, uh, and uh, Chaban government is also, recently I heard that Saudi Arabia is also contributing to some uh, projects regarding TEVIT. Uh, thank you very much, Lotus. Sorry for one minute past my time. No, it was really very interesting. So, and still we have some time to take just a few questions. So, before the break, we can have two or three questions, I suppose. Who will be first? My name is Giovanni Crisona. <clears throat> I would like to know about the entrepreneurial uh, um, activities, that, that learning that you implement. What are the results that you have seen in the students after um, a while, or if you did this and you don't have yet the results? So if you have monitored... Uh, Just uh, thank you for your question. It's quite important. On the one hand, when we involve this in students in this type of situations, it's difficult to maintain the motivation through all the year, through all the program. And at the beginning, we make some questions to them how they feel with the learning, the new learning scenario that they have to face. At the very beginning, sometimes they told us oh, please, let's forget about new learning methodology and let's go back to traditional lessons. But at the time is going on, the students are the ones that wanted to continue with this process and they realize that they are evolving and developing their skills. And when we make the initial meetings, no one is volunteer for going and leaving the center. But when we make the, the Congress that you have seen, students really wanted to go, wanted to participate, wanted to develop their skills. So they realized that in this world it's necessary to work this way. And at the end, they love this type of working. Because they told us, please, told to the other teachers to work the same way as you. So for us it's very important and it's an evidence of that we are working in the proper way with them. A second question, Denise. Very different uh, presentation, all very interesting. So I, I'm, I will try to ask a question so that all of you can answer. Um, so, what would be the one lesson learned that uh, you have, either from the study that you both conducted, Simon and uh, Agnes, and Inji, Suzanne, and Hamid, one lesson learned that uh, you feel we could benefit from hearing? Very interesting question. A few seconds. Each speaker, should we start from the right? From Agnes? <laughs> <clears throat> That's um, the question I had as well <laughs> during the representation. What is, um, I think, um, well, I think I found a lot of elements um, in all presentation which are common. I think it's um, the lesson we, we are shifting between formal and informal uh, um, frameworks and, um, of learning. And I think it, it's important for competence development to have informal frame of references. That is work-based learning, that is uh, everything all. But um, we need to have a reference for that. The references are formal. There are certificates, they are um, qualification frameworks, and, and they, they provide us with an, um, 
um, market value. Without that, um, people don't and cannot move between employment sectors. They, they, they don't have a value uh, of qualification. Therefore, I think we have to think both frameworks together, and that is really um, concerning the different kind of conditions uh, or in, on a global scale. That is an, a real challenge to manage a good um, adaptation and a movement between formal and informal structures. I think that is the most uh, um, challenge. Yes, uh, in my point of view, for me the most important thing is to provide the students the main role and to be a model for them. I could not tell the students to be entrepreneur or to innovate if I don't do it. So we try to innovate, we take risk. Sometimes we make mistakes, but we talk about this mistake with our students because we tell them that this is the way of improving, taking risk and making mistakes. If I can <coughs> link to Susan's presentation, I mean, I think it's the significance of the recognition of prior learning. I mean, it's something that we talk about a lot, but actually if you look at how much actually goes on, it's often quite limited for all sorts of reasons, and that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Well, disruption or no disruption, I think what we have is a focus on our people. So if you want to really do something to improve the lives of our people, then nothing is impossible. Especially in my line of work, I'm in, regula I'm in regulation, but at the same time we have to be flexible, we have to scale, we have to be agile in all the things that we do so that we are able to help our people wherever they are, in the country or overseas. So um, with this in mind and with the help of your leaders and the partners. Collaboration is very important. Coordination with all uh, organizations that matter is very important. And um, the interest of the people themselves to be helped. So I think that's what we learn. Uh, um, I think, uh, uh, Dennis, that the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda, 17 goals, when they talk about education, goal fourth, it's actually as a goal in itself but also a means to achieve the other 17 goal. So if we want really to um, achieve the agenda of 2030 uh, all across the countries, we need to invest in education. And coming from a, a post-conflict area, we think that the tethered or upskilling the ex-combatant or the refugee who come back to their countries, uh, to their area, arm them with the skills and the knowledge, uh, take them away to be prey of the extremist and build their own. Uh, so so th there should be a need and commitment uh, for the uh, investment in Tevit, and especially the response conflict area. Thank you. Just the last question, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to say my thanks to all five member of panels, distinguished, and plus one from CEDEFOP. Uh, um, but my question is, the, uh, Agnes, please, yes, uh, work-based uh, learning. I want to know uh, some sentence about the uh, teachers uh, in this, uh, say, I mean project, in this system. What's, you use the same uh, current teachers or TVET teachers or trainers or no, they will be equipped with the new competencies or skills, yes. Your question is what, what kind of um, trainers or teachers uh, I mean? Well, that is an, an, a question. On a global scale, they are very different persons. Um, in in school-based systems, of course, they are teachers at schools who are trying to give a pathway also to work and to, to train. But, uh, for example, in Germany, there are um, persons um, 
often senior employers, experienced persons, and in, in companies. And that, that is a very different kind of uh, group of persons. And they need another kind of training, of course. And um, if for Germany, example, uh, the example is that um, the companies trained, uh, companies trained trainers, uh, they, um, they have the challenge that uh, people have to learn or in the apprenticeship also to have very general skills uh, or transversal skills you, you mentioned um, and that, that they are not so educated um, to teach or to find ways to train exactly these kind of of uh, skills which are not in the daily life of in, in work. Uh, daily life in work has not so much possibilities to, to spend time on training, analyzing and reflecting and something like that. And well, that is an, a special challenge or demand for, for um, trainers within companies. But it's different. It's not um, there is no answer in a global scale and, and I think it's a research question to look who are really the persons uh, uh, and they are very different. The group of persons are very different. So, thanks a lot each of you for the presentations. I, I am afraid we didn't have much time for a dialogue but in reality it was quite packed the whole session. I want just to close by reminding you that this is a very interesting and important uh, topic. We cannot provide you with uh, answers. We can provide you with ideas, with approaches, successful cases, good practices. But I think, and coming back perhaps to what Denise mentioned, one underlying word behind this implementation. That means we have to implement. We have to bring closer theory to practice, and we have to move ahead. And having also in mind uh, Professor Ahmed's uh, presentation, uh, looking back to what happened to a country that was the best uh, example in the Middle East, we should have the strength to fight all types of disruptions. Because uh, uh, following Boren Chakrun's example yesterday, I can quote John Lennon from the Beatles. He said that life is what happens while we are busy making other plans. So now uh, the floor is to Jens and then we, you can have your break. <laughs>